Thank you guys so much. I got to tell you something this morning. It is really uncomfortable in here. I can't tell if it's hot, if it's cold. It's, you know, it's just not a very comfortable place right now. You know what happens too is when it's kind of that in between, my hands get kind of clammy. You know that? So even when I was shaking hands, it wasn't really that enjoyable this morning. You know, this tie has been just choking me. You know, I've always said that neckties are women's revenge for high heels, and I just... And church clothes aren't the most comfortable either. You know, I didn't want to play guitar this morning either. My wife made me. Thanks. That was fun. And then I had to sit and listen to some guy talk about birds landing on his head or something. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? How many of you guys like a complainer? Was that fun? You want to hear more? I'm actually a professional complainer. I I can do this all day. I've been preaching recently on the holiness of God, and as I uh, as we've kind of transitioned and and gone through different you know elements of of study, and as the seasons have changed, I was uh, really convicted, and the Lord said I need to go in a different direction. So I'm opening up a new uh, passage of study, looking at attitudes. Answers and attitudes. And we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture that will, I think, be of benefit to us as we see that God wants us to learn some lessons uh, that I think are very appropriate to our, our time and our lives right now. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you that we can be here, and thank you that we can take this time, Father, to examine your plan for our lives. Uh, thank you that we can learn from your Scriptures. Teach us now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be talking about complaining this morning. And uh, I don't want you to complain about it later. First volume of the testimonies, it says, It is easy to rebel. It is easy to give battle before considering matters rationally, calmly, and settling whether there is anything to war against. The children of Israel are an example to who? The children of Israel are an example to us upon whom the ends of the world are, are come. And you know, we are a Seventh-day Adventist. We've been preaching the return of Christ for 150 years. And we know that the prophecies and the way scriptures are unfolding, that we are getting closer to the end, right? And if we are studying our Bibles and if we are looking at how history and prophecy are coming together, uh, we should be all the more expecting the soon return of Christ. So in that light... The stories of the children of Israel in the wilderness are all the more appropriate for us to look at because their journey is our journey. And that's what I want to invite you on in this next few weeks of talks about looking at how the children of Israel succeeded and how they failed in finding their way to the promised land. And we're going to be looking at their attitudes and the answers that the Lord wants us to understand because these stories are for us. So for my kids' quiz today, just a couple of questions, but I would like some help. Toby, if you're willing, got pink and uh, blue. Which one do you want? Big surprise. (laughs) Uh, Just a couple of questions. So this is for the young people. I just like to engage with them a little bit. Why did the children of Israel complain during the wilderness wandering? Uh, So if you remember the story, if you remember it, so here are your options. I just put them up there. (laughs) Is it they had no food, no leadership, they were afraid of the giants, they thought God had abandoned them, or their hearts were hard and simple. Who are are we at over here? Ketsia? Did I say one? Just They had... Yeah, just say one. They had no food or water. They had no food or water? Okay, maybe. And then, uh, yeah... They had no food or water. Okay, so yeah, I've got two people saying no food or water. Let's have another answer or two. I see Abel. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that Anna? Go ahead, Anna. D. D. They thought God had abandoned them. Go to Abel here, Toby, and then, uh, yeah, right here. I was also going to say D. Okay, thank you, Abel. Go ahead. E. E. Well, in a way, they're all right, but ultimately, the Bible teaches 
It was the issue of the heart, first and foremost. If their hearts were not hard and sinful, they would have looked at the other circumstances differently and uh, their attitude would have been different. But the Bible reveals that even though God had taken them out of Egypt, they never really left Egypt. You've heard that saying before, Egypt went with them. The Lord said to Moses, this is in Numbers 14, how much longer will these people reject me? Every time they complained, God took it personal. And said, it's not that they're just hungry, it's not just that they're afraid, but every time they complain, they're rejecting me. How much longer will they refuse to trust me, even though I perform so many miracles among them? Number two, how did God lead and appear to Israel during the wilderness wanderings? Was it as a burning bush, pillar of cloud, and a pillar of fire, golden calf, or an angelic warrior? I see Dylan's hand, and then we'll go back here to Lindell. Uh, a burning bush. As a burning bush? Mmm. On the wilderness wanderings? Maybe. Let's go to Lindell. As a pillar of cloud and as a pillar of fire. That is the one we were watching. Yes. The, now, there's a little bit of a trick question because the Lord did appear in other ways. But in the wilderness, the God led them as that kind of tornado-like pillar that you would think of during the day and then that column of fire as it's portrayed uh, at night. That was the presence of God that went with them, and, and that would be significant. All right, this I only have one more for you this morning. How would you characterize the attitude of Israel during the wilderness wanderings? Cranky, greedy, critical. Do we see anyone? All right, Katie. Hi, Katie. Cranky. Cranky? You don't know anything about that, do you? No, you're never cranky. Oh, go ahead. Is that uh, Eric? Greedy. Greedy? Okay, maybe so, maybe so. All right, Sebastian? All of them. All of them. You're going right for the whole list. Yeah, sometimes like, okay, we're going to let... Rebellious. Rebellious. Well, you guys kind of saw it all. I see your hands, Dylan, Abel, and... Oh, I don't know your name. What's your name? Well, Toby, bring the mic over here for uh, this young man. Let's let him have a chance, too. What, tell me your name first. Gianni. Gianni? Yes. Gianni. Yes. Gianni. Okay, what, what would you say to this, Gianni? Critical. 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 Well, actually, you are all right, and Sebastian's the most right, because they really were all of those. They really were all of those. I love cats, I do, but when I saw this picture, it just like embodied all of these things. <laughs> that face that a cat can make, cranky, greedy, thank you very much. Yeah, or you can put it on the pew, whichever works. It was not the best experience for them, and they had some problems. So this is what Paul says in the New Testament. I do not want you to be unaware. Oh, thank you, uh, Mike operators. Thank you, kids. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Jesus Christ is illustrated, and his plan uh, uh, for salvation is all throughout this story. Nevertheless, with most, most of them, excuse me, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happened as examples for us so that we would not, see what I've underlined here, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Well, sometimes we don't think of it in that context, but the problem with the children of Israel in the wilderness wandering is that they craved evil things. And we are not so different today. The brokenness of sin in our hearts, the pressures of our society, our giving in to some of the temptations and deceptions of the devil leads us to crave evil things. And one of the things we love to do is complain. We love to complain. Don't sit there and lie to me like you don't think that's true. You know that's true. We are a complaining society. Uh, we're going to get into the story here, Numbers 11, to, to identify this first issue of attitudes in the wilderness. Now, the people, no, notice how Moses writes this. The people became like those who complain. And I, I know that he's writing this because everyone who would listen to this understands what it's like to be around those who complain. Do you guys, do you know what I mean? Any of you been around those who complain? 
It seems like anytime you have a group together, different personalities and dynamics like surface, like this person is kind of the, the, the helper, this person's the quiet person, this person's the leader, and there's almost always someone who's the complainer. It just is kind of like the human dynamic. Uh, being around someone who complains uh, is not a happy experience, especially uh, if if it's just become so ingrained into their being. Now, we all complain at times, and there's there's somewhat, you can say, kind of innocent complaints or benign complaints. We complain about the weather, or we complain that our sports team isn't doing like we would like, or we complain about too much homework or something like that. Um, but what the what is happening here in the story with the children of Israel is not just some sort of superficial observation about the struggles that they're having. When Moses says the people became like those who complain of adversity, he is talking about a deep-seated uh, uh, focus and, and viciousness in their complaint. And the way he talks about it, it's not that they're complaining to the Lord, they're complaining in the hearing of the Lord. You ever had someone, you know, insult you under their breath, but they do it just loud enough that you can hear them? You know, you, you do something they don't like and they kind of walk away and they go, what a jerk, right? But you know they did it just loud enough so that you can hear. That's kind of what's happening here. The children of Israel are not just saying this is tough, there's some struggles here, the food isn't exactly what we want. They have allowed a detrimental, dangerous, and deadly spirit of divisive complaining overcome their being to the point that if it was, if because of its contagious nature, threatened the very uh, unity and existence of this small band of Israelites trying to make it on their way to Israel and we know, or to the promised land. And we know that because the punishment is in proportion to the sin. And so it says, when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Now that doesn't just mean like the tents and the equipment. That means the people, okay, people died in this moment. When it says it burned the outskirts of the camp, it was, it's like there was just a fire that went out. And again, the symbolism of fire in this whole story, uh, is, is quite significant. I don't have time to get into it now, but from the burning bush, that bur- bush that should have been consumed but was not, and then in the, on the Mount Sinai experience, when the children of Israel looked up, it says they saw the glory of the Lord and it, per- and it appeared as a consuming fire. They were dwelling with consuming fire. That's what the presence of the Lord is. When the Shekinah glory comes into the sanctuary, it is a consuming fire. They dwelt in that consuming fire as long as they were abiding by His grace. But as soon as they defiantly sin, now in Numbers 15, it'll talk a little bit more about the sin of Israel and how they were sinning defiantly. And the Hebrew makes it almost like you're shaking your fist in the face of God. Okay, that was the depth of this complaint. That was the depth of their their giving up or their their uh, 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 violating the grace of God. So God's consuming fire can't help but break out in this time to put a stop to this com- complaining attitude. It goes on, now the people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberah, which means fire, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. So one of the first deadly attitudes that we face on this journey is the easy temptation to give up on the grace of God and enter into a spirit of complaining. And that's what I want to talk about today, complaining. Now, in our society, complaining has become so natural, so easy, so common, so unexpected that we don't even realize that we're doing it. Or we've come to expect it as though that's the norm and an appropriate thing to do. But in reality, complaining is the first step towards a a devastating avalanche slide away from God and into a, a much worse circumstance. And we'll see that as the story continues in in following weeks. But what is an attitude? An attitude is not just a momentary, you know, fit of anger or, or, uh, you know, just a a being depressed momentarily or anything like that. An attitude, all three of these elements are critical. It's settled patterns of thinking. It's a default. You don't even know you're doing it. If you're a generous person, you don't really know that you're generous. You have allowed generosity to become the normal so that when you have opportunity to give, you don't think, hmm, am I going to be generous today or not? Well, I want to be generous, so I'm going to give, right? It becomes a default. If you're a critical person, you don't think to yourself, I need to be critical at this moment right now. Let me think how I can be critical. 
You just naturally are. It is your default. Your attitude is a settled pattern of thinking. Okay? It is an established a root in your in your body developed over long periods of time typically. These things don't happen overnight. People are, you know, I know we're born in sin and, you know, little babies are selfish or whatnot. But as we grow, we don't just normally naturally become bitter. If you're a five-year-old today and you're just bitter, that's not, that's not typically normal, right? These things develop over time. And they're always, always, always reflected in our behavior. We cannot divorce or distance ourselves from our attitudes and say, well, my attitude only affects me. I may be negative. I might complain a little bit, but it's not hurting anybody. It's not really doing anything. No, our attitudes are always reflected in our lifestyle. If we are a complaining person, it will affect those around us. It'll affect how we operate and how we think about God and how we think about each other and ourselves. For as he thinks within himself, so he is, Proverbs says. Complaining in the wilderness. What does it mean to complain? Now, this is important. Complaining is to express dissatisfaction with a circumstance that is not wrong. Okay? You are complaining about something. It's a complaint if you are expressing dissatisfaction with a circumstance that's not wrong. If you are saying, if there is some, and I'm going to have to put some context here. Um, if there's a, a, a valid injustice, if there is a, a, a real problem and you say, hey, that's wrong. We need to correct that. We need to do something about it. That's not complaining, right? If there's a real injustice, all right? The problem is we convince ourselves that every little thing that we don't like, every little thing that doesn't go with our preferences is an injustice. I wanted tacos tonight. My wife gave me spaghetti. And that's an injustice. And I'm going to raise up my voice and complain and say, how dare you? I wanted tacos. Now, is there anything wrong with spaghetti? Uh, You you understand what I'm saying? Complainers are those who look at a, a, a circumstance and they prefer something different. Their opinion is something different. Their perception is something different. But they twist it to interpret it as though their preference is a moral, uh, 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 you know, indicative and that they must uh, uh, complain about that. And the second part of this is equally true, for which they are doing nothing to correct. Now, if I said, now, honey, I love, I love you and the tacos, you know, we can do that later. How can I help, though? I'll do the dishes and, and so that we can work this out together. That would be a more constructive way to work out a preference. But if I was just to sit there and say, I wanted tacos, get in there, get the meat going and the cheese and everything, make it for me right now, that would be, well, I wouldn't be around very much longer. That would be bad. For which you're doing nothing to correct. Have you ever, and by the way, I am honest about this. This is, this is, uh, you know, primal. This is something that I think affects all of us to a degree, but some of us are very professionals at this. And, and I come from a long line of very professional complainers. I'm really good at it. But that part of which you're doing nothing to correct, or you're not trying to correct. Any of you ever known someone who will say things like, you know, I'm cold. You say, all right, can I get you a jacket? No, no, no. But I'm cold. Well, can I get you a blanket and help it? No, no, no. But I'm cold. Well, can I turn up the thermostat? Can I do it? No! I'm cold. It's like they want to live. It's like kind of that martyr complex. You know? Don't do anything to correct it. I'm not going to do it, but I just want you to know how unhappy I am right now. But I don't want anything to change because I don't want to give up my unhappiness. I just want you to know it. Those are not fun and, and, and enlightening and enriching moments. And this is, this is what complaining is. We need to differentiate complaining from legitimate, you know, uh, injustices and from criticism and things like that. These things have different things. A complaint is for something that you just have a different preference on and you're unwilling to take any action to bring resolution to it. Those are, those are tough things and they are not, uh, Again, we justify it in our mind. We, no one sits down and just says, I'm go- I have decided I'm going to complain about this. We think of uh, sin and everything in our mind. Twisted to we think, I'm not, oh, the, the one I hear people say, I'm not complaining, I'm just educating others. Ever hear that one before? 
oh man, I just, I'm not complaining, I'm just educating. Why, why, I'm, I'm yelling at the TV because I think the people on it can hear me and that, that's going to work out great. Now, um, it says that they complained in, in uh, the book of Numbers because of adversity. And sometimes we think we have been justified in, work, in our complaint. Say, well, yeah, the things you're talking about, Pastor, they don't really matter. But I mean, if you're really in adversity, if you're really suffering, if you're really facing trials, well, then don't you have a right to complain? I mean, isn't that what it, you know, if I'm really struggling, that, that's when you have a right to complain, right? No, again, that's not what the Bible says. In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider God has made one, one as well as the other. What do we do when we complain in adversity? We're declaring that God is not with us. We're declaring that what hap- is happening to us is out of God's control and God is unjustly, you know, forwarding something on us. Job says, um, you, he's speaking to his wife here. Be careful. <clears throat> you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. Some adversity does come from God, right? Some adversity is there for our growth and our maturity and our refining. And if we complain about that from God, what are we saying? We're saying, God, get out of my life. I don't like what you're providing for me. Some adversity does come from the devil. The devil hates us. The devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But when we complain about that, we're saying, God, what the devil's doing to me isn't fair, and you're not doing anything about it. You must not be a very good God. But the majority of adversity in our life, I would submit to you this morning, is of our own making, is of our own design, of our own decisions, sometimes of our own foolishness, sometimes out of our own innocence. But a lot of adversity, we put ourselves in these positions. And uh, I could speak more about that. I think you know what I mean. A couple more passages. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Not all adversity is an evil. Some adversity is there for our growth and our maturity. And when we complain, we are missing the boat. We are missing the point. Very important when it comes to all attitudes. We choose our attitudes. They are not forced upon us. We are not victims of our attitudes. We choose them. Now, they are settled patterns of behavior. They do take a long time to develop, and they do become a default in our life. But ultimately, we choose how we are going to manage these stimuli and circumstances that come into our life. And when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we always ask first and foremost that God would show us His plan in every circumstance before we jump to our own emotional conclusions. And we would save ourselves a lot of grief in the Christian life and in our journey if we would make our our priority and our goal to do that. Our, Our attitudes do not control us or force us against our wills. When we complain, it's our own choice couple of things I think we all know. Complaining robs joy of everyone. And again, you've all been there before. Just a brief uh, illustration. I was uh, out with a group of pastors. We were out at a restaurant, and we were, uh, you know, having a very nice meal together. And, uh, you know, the waiters and waitresses, they always come, how is everything? Can I get you more water? You know, they're working on their tip and all that. Um, and, you know, not everything is always perfect. Sometimes things could be a little bit better. And all of us were like, you know, we're doing good. The water is fine. And, and you brought the food and it seems right. But there was one of them, pastors, who decided they were not happy. And so they complained. They said the food wasn't right. They said the plate was dirty. They said it was, you know, too loud. It didn't smell good. The floor was sticky. They just went on and on and on. We started out having a good time. From that moment, We all kind of just sat there in silence like, so how you doing? It just absolutely ruined the joy of the moment. Complaining robs joy from everyone. Although misery loves company. And I think a lot of times when we complain, we're hoping to draw people in with us, which is, again, the problem what happened with the children of Israel. Their complaining became contagious and it was spreading throughout the community. Complaining dishonors the grace of God. And really, when you think about it, of all that God had done for them, and that's what the verse uh, that I read earlier said um, from today's English version, when God says, it's me they've rejected, 
despite all that I've done for them. I mean, when you think about it, they brought them out of slavery. They purged Egypt and, and uh, uh, you know, were enriched by the, the, the treasures of Egypt when they left. God was physically, visibly present with them, and they still chose to complain. It's a brutal, brutal reality. They dishonor the Lord. Complaining is easy, common, and natural. Watch your spirits because this is something we naturally will do. Complaining comes so easy. It's kind of that initial rush that you get. Um, um, Pastor John, you were talking about drugs, you know. That initial rush of endorphins and, and all those uh, neurotransmitters in your brain that you feel like you're going to receive when you release all that. Oh, but I'm upset about this. And oh, this is ugly and this is awful. We think it's going to make us feel better. But it's a lie. It often and always makes things worse. Complaining can be seen in actions as well as words. It will always affect our actions. It's selfish and sinful and it is deadly. Complaining kills the spirit. It kills the spirit. And that's why the Lord had to do such a dramatic thing in illustrating to the children of Israel, you cannot go down this route. The moment you step down the route of allowing a complaining spirit to dominate your life, it is, an, it is a terrible road that is not easy to turn around and back up on. Now, the grace and power of God is there, friends, and he does not abandon us. But if we allow that to become deep-seated in our hearts, and we live in a society that has embraced this wholeheartedly, we give people awards for complaining. We, we feed, we feast on complaining in our society. Now, what do the people do? What's the solution to complaining? After they realized that this wasn't working out and that the Lord was angry, it says, that, therefore, the people cried out to Moses and Moses prayed to the Lord and the fire died out. They go to the deliverer. Moses is the deliverer. He is kind of a type of Christ. They go to the leadership that God has established. They go to Christ, right? Remember, uh, Paul said that they all drank from the spiritual rock and that rock was Christ. They went to the source of grace. They went to Moses and then Moses, as the intercessor, prayed to the Lord. And the Lord heard that, forgave them, and continued to work with them on the journey. So, again, they originally they didn't complain to the Lord. They simply complained in the Lord's hearing. And there's a huge difference between those. Talk about that more in just a second. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a little... Was that me, Sebastian, or was that you? I have a complaint right now. <laughs> you know, while we're, they're helping me get this up, uh, I'll just give you a, a piece of advice. If you are consuming in large volumes social media and politics, Guard your spirit because you are probably a complainer. Or you like listening to others complain. And I'm not saying all things. You know, politics, I'm not so much on social media. But politics, I'm kind of like my indoor sport. I kind of like a good debate, a good argument. I like to hear the different sides and everything. Uh, but if you, get, if you get too much into it, it will wreck your spirit, won't it? It will absolutely. And if you're in that, you might decide to take a little bit of a fast. Uh, thank you, uh, our technology team back there. You might want to take a little bit of a fast from social media or politics because uh, there's nothing that will just drag you down faster than I think those two platforms for which uh, just so much of this happens. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, Paul says, so that you'll prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. If we simply go along with the criticism and complaints and pessimism of those around us? What are we doing? Are we representing Christ when we do that? Aren't we supposed to be different? 
Aren't we supposed to be sharing the love of Jesus? Aren't we supposed to be revealing the power of God to change hearts? If we simply go along with the complaints, if we simply are, are just piling on with all the negativity in the world, and this is, this is not to say there's not things worth complaining about. There's all kinds of things that are problematic and, and challenges, true injustices, again, and that's different than, than complaining. But if we simply follow along with the natural, broken, selfish heart to just join in with the crowd and to march in the parade of complaint, then what are we doing in the church? We have got to steal ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit to be different and say, I hear what you're saying about this political issue. I hear what you're saying about this uncomfortable preference that you have. But did you know that there's another place that God is preparing for us? And as much as this is affecting you right now, there is another way of looking at this. We are to be lights in this world. I'm going to start preaching if I don't stop here. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. I think my clicker is kind of filled with a spirit other than mine. Do not complain, brethren. Come on. Do not complain, brethren, against one another so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. I like this one because he's, now he's talking about in the church. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. Of course, we don't complain in the church, do we? <laughs> we just love, love, love. We just walk in the door, and it's just nothing but joy and fellowship, right? Right? No, sometimes it, it's even worse. Sometimes we think because we're believers, we have an even greater right to complain. I think I told you this story before. Uh, I had a youth pastor once that <coughs> his family grew up running a bookstore. Where's Sandy? I know Sandy's here somewhere. There. They ran a bookstore. It was not an Adventist bookstore, but his family uh, uh, owned the bookstore. And so at growing up, he had to work in the bookstore, just like, you know, Sandy, your kids. And uh, um, Dar said, I will never work in a Christian bookstore again. I said, why? He said, because Christians have this chip on their shoulder. They think they can come in here and complain all that they want. And because they're a Christian, we just have to sit and take it. Why are your prices so high? Why can't I get a discount on this? How come you won't let me have this on order? I mean, and he, he just, and he went into ministry still. Praise the Lord. The God, you know, he was able to escape that critical moment, but he just said, I, I don't like working around Christians in a Christian bookstore because they're just so negative. Of course, that never happens in the ABC. Kindly, wonderful, generous people every time. But sometimes we think that our Christian walk gives us license. Do you, do you tend, okay, little litmus test. Do you tend to put your opinions and preferences and feelings before others? Then you might be a complainer. Do you find yourself quick to judge, lacking patience? And this is a big one. Assuming the worst. You know, there's always multiple perspectives and angles to everything. Do you always tend to go to the negative? I do. This is, this is a battle in my own spirit. I have to work on this because it's so easy just to always think the worst. And again, right now our society encourages, assume the worst. I was just telling my wife today, um, I'm sometimes even afraid to say hi to people I don't know. I'm kind of an outgoing person, you know, we go on walks, I'm like, hey, how you doing? Nice, nice shoes, I like, I like the hair over there, that's good stuff. Or, I like to talk. I have to be so careful because right now we're in a society where people assume the worst. Why are you talking to me? Why'd you say hi? Why did you say it that way? Why are you looking down at me when you say it? Why are you looking to the side, right? People are so uber sensitive. Are, are you assuming the worst? When someone cuts you off in traffic? Praise the Lord. They're in a bigger hurry than I am. Are you able to laugh at yourself? That's an important one to me. If you can't laugh at yourself at the end of the day, you're taking yourself a little too serious. And the complaining spirit may be over you. And I mentioned this one already. Are you consumed with platforms that cater to complaint? And there are others, but I think these are the big ones. <coughs> this is the last... <coughs> excuse me, losing my voice, so it's good. This is the last slide. We can complain. 
if we take our complaints to the Lord. Psalm 55, as for me, I shall call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, I will complain and murmur and he will hear my voice. And when we reserve our discontent and our problems to our private conversation with God, rather than dispelling it and dispensing it everywhere we go, it says, He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me or even in me. If you feel like you need to complain, go into your prayer closet and talk to the Lord. And He will work that out with you. But other than that, ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome a complaining spirit. And you'll see the power of God work in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much. We're just going to start this journey, Father, and there's so much more we're going to learn and study as we go along the way. But, Father, as I think we can all relate with this very basic principle. And again, I think it's so natural that sometimes we... We don't even realize how significant this is and how this will totally change the directory of our life, whether for the worse if we don't face it or for the better if you help us overcome it. So, Father, bless us. Give us strength and wisdom and humility to overcome this very natural challenge in the society in which we live. Help us not to be a people of complaining. Help us to be a people of your spirit and your joy and your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you next week. Sorry we went a little bit over today. Happy Sabbath.